un unethical behaviour in sport that day. And that goes across any level, from the very top to the very bottom. But the biggest row we had this year was about uh, a cricket story. I don't know if you saw it. It was um, a small amateur league game in South Wales. Carew Cricket Club. The last game of the season, Carew were top of the table. They were facing their rivals for the title. If their opponents won and got the, win the points for winning the game, but were also able to add a batting point bonus point or a bowling bonus point, the opponents would win the league. You burn, for those who don't follow cricket, um, you earn bonus points as well for, for the number of runs you score, wickets you take. So Carew batted first and they declared their innings as soon as they lost their first wicket, 18 for one. That prevented the chance of their opponents to earn any bonus bowling points and needing 19 to win. Of course, they couldn't get any batting bonus points. So although they won the game, it meant they couldn't overtake Carew at the top of the table. So Carew would be the champion. None of this, of course, is against the laws of cricket, but it's against the spirit. And there's a huge fuss across the sports media. It ended with a disciplinary committee confirming Carew as the champions. But interestingly here, they also relegated them for not acting in the spirit of the game. Now, I'm not sure whether a club game in South Wales has ever led to a more heated debate at, uh, in our, at Sky, and I know at other uh, newsrooms as well, where we usually focus on you know, behaviour of Jose Mourinho or players like Wayne Rooney, but the feelings ran really high that day. And it just shows how passionately we care about ethics in sport. So it follows that if sports journalists believe in ethical behaviour in the subject we cover, we too should behave ethically, especially if the one thing that makes us even angrier than, uh, than cheating or not playing by the rules is hypocrisy. But of course, of course, it's much more nuanced than that. So let's consider what does an ethical sports news organisation look like and how should ethical sports journalists behave? Well, I like to think that Sky Sports News upholds really high ethical standards. Yet one of our most respected reporters, without blessing, regularly doorstepped a supposedly frail man in his 70s chasing him down the road, going directly against requests from his family and colleagues. I'll come back to, to that later. But for me, it's crucial that everyone at Sky Sports News is trained and encouraged to think about ethics. Levison brought a sharper focus on ethics and culture across all media, not just print. At Sky, our values and our reputation demand it, and so do our viewers. And that training has to start early. As well as being the executive editor at Sky Sports News, I chair the uh, National Council for the Training of Journalists Accreditation Board, and that means I get to visit a large number of journalism courses around the UK. I was really encouraged several years ago with a visit to St Mary's University at Twickenham, which is Dara's course. A module on the MA in sports journalism there was titled Critical Issues in Sport. It's fantastic. It looked at some of the key ethical issues and stories that sports journalists had faced going back over the last 80, 90 years. You know, the Berlin Olympics, Nazi salutes in the Germany v England game shortly before World War II. It examined how those events were covered at the time, how they would be covered now, and what ethical, influence, it, in, what ethical issues influenced and might influence coverage. It was, it was just fantastic to see this on a course. I was really keen to sign up and do it, actually. <laughs> and this training is so important because the pace of news now means journalists are making decisions about what they write, publish, or broadcast faster than they've ever had to do before. And the economies of journalism mean there are fewer people around the newsroom. And very often the young, inexperienced journalists will have to make, make that on-the-spot, instant decision on their own. They need to know what to consider when they make decisions and they need to get it right. And to do that, they need the right training. And this training goes beyond compliance and regulation. Broadcasters work to Ofcom. There are a series of guidelines which provide some clear boundaries about what we can broadcast about, impartiality, rules about commercial influence, how we treat people when we gather information and material for broadcast. And the Ofcom code includes section seven on fairness. Section eight of the code deals with privacy. So we're heavily regulated already. And every self-respecting news organisation will also have its code of conduct. Point one in ours at Sky Sports News covers maintaining the highest professional and ethical standards. And the following points giving examples of what that would look like. Declaring conflict of interest, in a, if you're covering a story. Being fair and accurate. Being clear about the distinction between comment 
opinion and fact, not distorting comment, being selective or misrepresenting people, correcting inaccuracies, obtaining news by straightforward means only, no deception, not taking private advantage of information we may learn in our role at Sky Sports News, protecting our sources. But compliance, regulation, codes of conduct, while offering some kind of framework, don't go anywhere near covering all the ethical challenges a sports journalist faces going into 2018. And of course, the role of the sports journalist is changing rapidly. <coughs> My background was in uh, general news, local newspapers, national newspapers, and then in TV. I've always loved sport, but I resisted going into sports <coughs> journalism for many, many years. I shared the old view that sports acts are just fans with typewriters. Probably unfair, they often felt sports reporters were too close to the people they covered. Different times and different relationships, I know, but I had a suspicion that a huge number of sports reporters, and these were predominantly men at the time as well, turned a blind eye to various activities and behaviours in sport. Well, in return for that, of course, they had great access, often staying in the same hotels, living, touring, eating, and socialising with the people they reported on. That gave them some great insight into the games, lots of interviews with key players, but the stuff around it, not so much. I and some other news reporters at the time felt a lot of questions weren't being asked. The, rela the relationship to me felt a little, a little too cosy. So when I started covering sports stories properly, first for BBC TV News, then at Sky News, I met huge resistance, some from sport themselves, but even more from the established sports reporters and sports broadcasters at the time. They used to call us the rotters. A quaint way of uh, labelling those news reporters, chasing the newsier stories as objectionable, unpleasant and reprehensible. One famous broadcaster in particular was never shy about voicing his contempt for news, re news reporters who looked beyond the cosy interviews felt we were trying to spoil their party. But were these guys wrong? There were some great writers around at the time, some excellent broadcasters, but too often and too easily it could become this meaty relationship. We, the rotters, of course, had the advantage of having some distance from the people that we were covering. I was always curious, uh, particularly with athletics, as to why, with a couple of notable exceptions, athletics writers who covered the sport day after day, lived it and breathed it, weren't digging deeper and trying to uncover some of the amazing and astonishing performances of that era, of the Florence uh, um, Philip Joyner era. But the media explosion since the 90s has seen a huge change. Sports journalists now uh, are far more rounded. They challenge more, they ask tougher questions. But of course, they've also lost that closeness to the people that they cover, making it harder to talk directly to the people at the heart of the stories. Now, reporters rarely travel with teams, no longer stay in the same hotels, and there aren't the same opportunities now to go out for a few drinks with a star player or even meet up for informal chats in hotel bars. A few years ago, I could walk into a team hotel on the eve of a cup final and chat freely to players, officials, managers and coaching staff, eve of the FA Cup final. Not a chance of doing that now. Information and access are strictly controlled by teams of media officers. They dictate who will appear at press conferences, they coach those people who are going to appear at a press conference in what to say, advise them what to answer, and they even try to control the questions that journalists will ask. And even though I've lived through this change, I'm not sure what came first, whether the closer journalistic scrutiny led to the more protected environment, or whether the more protected environment and tougher access meant sports reporters now had a greater distance, enforced on them, but a distance nevertheless that allows them to take a step back and take a more critical view and probe more deeply into the broader issues. But this attempt to control information from clubs, agents and governing bodies has made it harder for those who want to speak out. Luckily for journalists, there are still people who do want to talk to us. And it's led to the growing phenomenon of the unnamed source. I've spent some time in the States recently and spoke to journalists, sports journalists uh, over there as well, where there's a similar trend. Both here and in the USA, journalists, sports journalists especially, as a rule, like to attribute the information we gather, the quotes, the comments, part of, the, part of our style guide, we always attribute. But the people who have taken, who have the best stories, are often the people who have the most to lose if it's discovered, they, if it's discovered that they told us. So, where possible, we, uh, we try to name people. Where we can't, we have to refer to unnamed sources. And we generally try to give some context around this. You know, say, 
or someone at the highest level of the club has told us, or someone with a detailed knowledge of this transfer deal has told us. An insider as governing body has told us this. But of course it's really difficult at times because you know, there's a danger we will give away the identity of this person, so we have to protect them. So too often, and usually only where we are satisfied the story is true, but we really do need to protect the identity of the person who's told us. We run with the Sky Sources. You've probably seen it at the bottom of our breaking news ticker. Uh, it's now quite a famous expression in, in sport, and treated with some suspicion by people I know, but it's, um, I promise you, it's, these are genuine. It's not ideal, and it does protect a source while telling our viewers something they can trust. And of course, not everyone who talks to us is always telling the truth. There are plenty of people eager to give us stories that are untrue. This can range from an agent trying to earn a pay rise to a player by insisting to us that another club want to sign him, to more elaborate falsehoods and hoaxes. Accuracy is really important to Sky Sports News. Our reputation is built on, on trust. Viewers, readers of our digital products rely on us to get it right. One wrong story, story would really damage our reputation. And often, what we don't put to screen is as important, if not more important, than the stories we do run. But with the media explosion over the last few years, it's clear that different rules apply to different organisations. At one end, we have the established trusted quality services, BBC Sky, The Times, The Guardian, and in the States, news organisations like ESPN or The New York Times, where people come for reliable quality news. On a smaller scale, the established local newspapers, their reputation depends on their accuracy and their reliability. Get it wrong, and the whole community knows, because, and that really will damage the brand. But there's a disturbing ground between, occupied by news and gossip sites, sometimes people with large Twitter followings, where different rules seem to apply. They can run stories without checking, will present opinion as fact, and run stories that are just wrong. They're popular, they present a problem for traditional news organisations, in the battle for viewers and readers. And we've had to respond to this. I think for a while most news organisations follow the two, sto two sources for, us, uh, for any story rule. But the pace of news now and increased competition means that's not workable for every single story. So we have a series of checks. Each story is different, but our first consideration for story sources who don't want to be named, are they in a position to know for certain what's happening here? We also consider our relationship with them. Are they reliable? Are they trustworthy? Is it a contact we can, we've used before, we'll use again? Then we consider, well, why are they telling us this? Any doubt, and we keep checking and checking. There's no science to it, and we have, after 20 years of Sky Sports News, a fantastic contact base, and good systems are quickly standing up, and just as importantly, knocking down stories. Part of that system concerns our approach to off the record. Now, in my opinion, there's no such thing as off the record. It's off the record, if it's off the record, not only does the person telling us this not want to be associated with the information they're telling us, a big difference from being an unnamed source. They don't want us to use it. But the fact they're telling us suggests they want to influence what we are saying and how we're presenting a story. Off the record also causes a dilemma and potential breakdown of trust with that contact because it's quite possible we could find out the information from another source and there'll be no convincing the original contact we've got the story from elsewhere. They feel we've been unethical and broken our, our promise of them. So off the record is not something that we do. And another thing on the subject of off the record, I was looking at the FA Independent Regulatory Commission for the David Moyes misconduct charge, where he was investigated, you may remember, and fined for telling a female reporter, Vicky, Star Vicky Sparks from BBC, that she, quote, might get a slap next time even though you're a woman. This came directly after a, a post-match interview when he was the Sunderland manager. I'll come to the challenge for women's sports journalists later. And indeed, the commission decided, interesting, that uh, Vicky Sparks' gender wasn't an issue in this case. But what I did find interesting was David Moyes' counsel's argument that because Moyes felt the might get a slap comment was off the record, he shouldn't be charged for it, which is uh, an interesting take. Presumably powerful people can treat journalists uh, um, threatened journalists off the record, that's very okay. But anyway, the Commission luckily dismissed this. But it's another example of how off the record really is meaningless. Um, football managers and the, uh, the power imbalance, they try to impose themselves in dealings with the press all the time. Moises uh, luckily knew that. One manager, when he didn't like a question from our reporter, accused him in a packed press conference of playing pocket billiards, just a way to deflect and humiliate uh, a reporter. We have a female rugby reporter, a well-known international coach, 
dismissively answered her questions with one word answers. When a male reporter asked the same question, the coach gave expansive and interesting answers. Well, how do we tackle this? It's a, it's a problem for us. We've got every faith. These are really good journalists uh, that we have. We can suspect it's sexist behaviour, but we can't prove it. We can raise the governing bodies, but unless the pattern continues, it's difficult to bring it to a head. Well, luckily, the world is changing. Women are now being treated better. Examples like that are, are, are rarer and rarer. More women are entering sports journalism. They have great skills, great talent, and the people they cover are now seeing that. In the same way younger footballers are used to female doctors and physios around their clubs now, they too accept female reporters. Well, not there yet, but attitudes are changing. There's a target for sports journalism courses to make sure that the number of uh, female sports uh, uh, students they take on is up to 25% of each intake. Now, that was from, used to be fewer than one in nine. More journalism students from general uh, courses uh, uh, are women than men. In sport, it's the other way. We're working hard, and the courses are working hard to, to change that. <coughs> As this new generation of sports journalists start their careers, so they join a profession that's examining its own behaviours and covering a subject that shines a light on some of the key ethical questions in broader society. The take a knee debate, race and sex discrimination, corruption, gambling, drugs, mental health. We need people equipped to handle these questions and people equipped to think about how we gather information and how we present that information. There's been a huge change in the coverage of mental health actually uh, around sport in recent years. Uh, at the time of Leveson, the British Psychological Society published some papers that really raised awareness around use of language and the impact of irresponsible reporting. And this led to some rethinking among many sports journalists. Many of the people we write and broadcast about are not chosen to be the centre of attention. They, they receive attention because of their outstanding ability at sport. So should sports journalists be more aware of the impact of what we say and what we write? Well, I like to think sports journalists are more aware these days. The reports earlier this year about the Everton footballer Aaron Lennon being detained under the Mental Health Act for his own safety is a good example. In the news sections of two national newspapers, the papers referred to £55,000 a week footballer Aaron Lennon. Another dug over a couple of uh, incidents in Lennon's, in Lennon's personal life. And it was the sports writers and sports sections that challenged the tone of that reporting, far more sympathetic and Increasingly, sports journalists are aware of the risks around mental health issues for people involved in sport. Mind have published research uh, which shows that people aged between 16 to 34 had a one in four chance of meeting the clinical criteria for one or more mental health disorders. 16 to 34, if you just think about that, it just about covers an athlete's, a professional sportsman or woman's career. So the challenges they face, of course, as a 16 year old away from home, a new environment, feeling isolated, to all the way through to someone in their mid-30s, the career coming to an end, facing rejection, being dropped, sold to a lesser club, their status diminished. And throughout their career, constantly under scrutiny from coaches, from fans, social media as we've heard are never shy about this, and from sports journalists and pundits assessing their performance. The mental health of the player is the responsibility of their employers and the government bodies. But we in the media must be aware of our responsibilities too, and the ethical issues around reporting mental health. At Sky Sports News, we run training courses, we invite guests, speakers, to mind players who suffered from mental health issues to try to improve our reporting. We've seen several high profile cricketers go public with their mental health issues. We need to keep learning about how we best report these issues and to help the people who watch, listen and read our content to achieve a better understanding. I've mentioned the uh, impact uh, of Leveson, but broadcasters already have a huge number of regulatory uh, issues where we're kind of uh, boxing how we can, uh, how we operate. Take the question of balance. As journalists, we gather facts from opinion and present balanced arguments, always looking for different views to help us and our viewers and readers reach an understanding. But if you look at the take and knee debate, feelings run really strong in the US, and they run pretty strongly here. Talk about our morning conferences, really strong debates about how we cover that uh, issue. And one of the news teams gave far greater coverage to the players' reasons for, for making the protest and the support they uh, they received. They covered Trump's comments about the taking knee on Twitter, taking a shot at the players and the NFL. But rather than explain more about why Trump was saying what he was saying, they covered the more criticism of, it, of his comments. 
that were they right, it wasn't very balanced at all. Or should they have tried better to explain Trump's reasoning and explain more why he had such support across the US for his position? And the question was, should we give equal weight to both sides of an argument, even when one side does seem to be spurious? Can we stay objective? Are, are we objective? We should certainly try to be objective, but I'm sure that's not best achieved all the time by giving equal minutage to opposing opinions. So how we present news and how we gather news brings us challenges. Chasing accurate, reliable information and beating the competition to it gets harder. Competition is changing, as we've heard. We know where we stand with established traditional rivals, the BBC, newspapers, radio, and websites, websites associated with them. But we also face new media organisations with a more cavalier attitude to the truth and to fact-checking, for whom the number of clicks, as we've heard uh, earlier today, is far more important. And then we have official club websites, which we've heard a bit about as well, desperate to break their good news in their own way. It's always good news on the club website. They want to announce new signings, control the questions and answers on interviews. And sometimes the only interview access with a key figure in the news is from a club channel. And that causes us uh, a problem. Well, newspapers and websites, websites will run the quotes. We have to run the pictures with a credit for that channel. Now, most club channels are a little more than propagandist services. Tracy may not agree, but in my opinion they are. And we used to be really snippy about running these interviews, but we've had to ad adapt. Uh, we, will run, we will run these if we have to. But the editorial integrity, we firstly clearly identify the interview as being from the club channel. And secondly, and really importantly, we highlight what's not been asked, the questions that the club channel is not, asked, not asking if they're relevant. We've had to also respond to the number of rumours that fly around on social media. We've set up a, a special news gathering team. Its first priority is to break original news. But as a secondary role, <coughs> it checks out quickly and reliably some of the wilder stories that originate on social media. And because of our scale, our contacts and our reputation, we can very quickly establish when a rumour has something in it. And we can also knock down rumours very quickly when there's nothing in it. The challenge comes when a rumour gathers momentum on social media. We can't ignore it, so we're honest with our viewers. We have to be honest. Uh, being a live channel, we're lucky we can, we can do this. Uh, we can have a reporter tell our viewers that this is a rumour we know is gaining traction, that we are checking it to verify it, and we will update as soon as we can. It's not where we were a few years ago, where we waited to confirm a story before putting it to air, but at least we're still being honest with our viewers. So checking and originating content is important. Responsible media organisations will invest, but they are facing